Joe Biden waves an executive wand on student loan debt and Anthony Fauci hangs up his lab coat and mask. We'll discuss all this and more on this edition of The Editors. I'm Rich Lowry and I'm joined as always by the right Honorable Charles C.W. Cook, Madeline Maddie Kearns and the notorious M.B.D. Michael Brendan Doherty, you are, of course, listening to a National Review podcast. Our sponsors this episode are ExpressVPN and the American Federation for Children. More about them in due course. If for some reason you're not already following us on a streaming service, you can find us everywhere from Spotify to iTunes. And if you like what you hear here, please consider giving us a glowing five-star review on iTunes. If you don't like what you hear here, please forget said Anything. So this is the the question I have to to ask here. I think that a lot of people have been wondering on a lot of people's minds right now who've been reading Charlie's stuff on the website or following him on Twitter. Charlie, are you okay? I am okay, but I have to say this story could have been concocted in a laboratory to annoy me start to finish from top to bottom it hits everything that irritates me it, it and you're using annoyance in the highest sense this isn't like you know the the air conditioning isn't the right temperature this this is this is high level this is constitutional regime level annoyance i think that the events of the last week call into question whether we have a constitutional system i don't wish to sound alarmist, but if the President of the United States can, at the stroke of a pen, using a legal justification that everybody knows is farcical, and until last week no one would ever have thought of, and until last year nobody had proposed in any form, spend between half a trillion and a trillion dollars without Congress, then the Constitution under which we supposedly live is useless. Yeah, so what they're pointing to is the HEROES Act, which passed in 2003, clearly intended to hold harmless people who are going to, you know, have student loans and are going to be sent to, to, uh, to Fallujah or, you know, be, be stationed in Kabul for 12 months or subject to a national, uh, a natural disaster such that, you know, you're in, you're in Florida and Hurricane Andrew strikes and your community is wiped out. And you lose your job and you can't pay your student loan for six months to hold you harmless. But the idea that this uh, MD, MBD was supposed to apply to the entirety of the population is completely insane at every single level. One, as Charlie points out, no one who voted for this thing or drafted this thing had any idea that it would be used in this way. It passed the Republican House in 2003 pretty much unanimously. There was one vote against, I guess, that one vote that one one guy or gal realized you know, <laughs> the, the abuse that this thing might might open us up to, passes unanimous, unanimous consent in a Republican Senate and signed by George W. Bush. And it, it says in the text of the legislation that you want to make sure that no one is worse off because of a war or national emergency. And uh, and you have to have suffered some direct harm. And neither of those things apply here. You know, there, there are many millions of people who are going to have student loan forgiveness that suffered no direct harm from the pandemic. And there's no effort to, to sift through all these people figuring out who suffered a direct harm and who didn't. So there's, there's not any real effort to apply the HEROES Act, even if you think it uh, should apply, uh, which it doesn't. And they're going to be better off. You know, the... Um, the the nose uh, under the camel's nose under the tent here was that it was used to uh, suspend debt um, payments during the during the pandemic, but arguably at least okay, you are holding people harmless, and eventually they're going to have to pay off these loans. These these, these people are uh, going to be um, benefiting from a bonanza, right? You know. $10,000 just wiped off or $20,000 if they had a, a Pell Grant. So they'll be better off. So even if you want to take the HEROES Act, literally that that argument, it it's obviously doesn't apply. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just they found whatever was handy, right? I mean, it was just this was there was talk in the Democratic Party and during the primaries and even in, in the last administration about doing something about student debt. 
and should we do it or should we not do it? You know, who really are the beneficiaries, et cetera. Uh, and it looks like at some point the Biden administration determined that they didn't have the votes in Congress to pat, you know, to see legislation passed to this effect or that Congress wasn't just wasn't interested in doing this because it might be controversial. So they just took whatever was already on the books and just tried to squeeze it until uh, it yielded this result. And there, it's it's a total hash. Um, I agree with Charlie. It's a, it's a total mockery of the of the law as it stands. Um, and and that's putting aside the kind of moral and substantive content of it, which is this is a giveaway and a boff to a constituency they're worried about in November. They're worried that younger voters aren't going to show up in that younger affluent liberal voters aren't going to show up for Democrats in November. And so they're giving them a giveaway. Um, and I find it really, I mean, I haven't talked about this, this policy before, I think on the show, um, I find it really ominous when you pair this with the expansion of the IRS, uh, which they've been almost very clear uh, in some of the instructional videos and other things that are leaking out, that this isn't about, you know, finding out what major corporations are doing with their armies of accountants and lawyers to, you know, disguise um, as something else. This is about shaking down landscapers, small business owners, car dealers, self-starters, the self-employed, basically people that they think belong to the Republican, you know, petty bourgeoisie uh mm -hmm. like it's 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 a partisan expansion of the irs it was a partisan uh debt jubilee uh and worse it's a partisan debt jubilee that like it, it doesn't address it, it makes worse all of the incentives for colleges and for prospective students going forward uh so colleges should feel free to raise their tuition by ten or twenty thousand dollars a year, if you're if you're at the top tier, uh, and hire more uh, deans to police Title Seven and Title Nine issues uh, on campus, or hire more, you know, food, um, you know, these food palaces that you see at the at the <laughs> big schools now. Like, do, I mean, have you seen these? Like, I went to like Duke to give a talk once, and they're like food court. <laughs> was like the size of of a shopping mall that used to, that I used to go to in New Jersey. It was utterly ridiculous. It's yeah, like you had to and like literally they're like serving like the farm dad, table. You had to suffer There's, through eating really bad shepherd's pie, right? <laughs> no, they're like serving like this farm to table stuff. <laughs> like you know, like when just twenty years ago, like the at most colleges you'd have like a cafeteria that was called the Rat or something like that, and now they have like, um, I don't know, like p people out there, that, like colleges are hiring people to like forward for like fresh truffles out <laughs> in the woods. Like I, I don't get it. Um, so anyway, this is a, anyway, it's a disgusting. <laughs> Uh, it's a disgusting giveaway, not just to student debtors, but to the colleges themselves and the expanding administrative class that the colleges are inflicting on our society. So, Maddie, there's no doubt there, there are some people who made really bad choices. There are some um, colleges that that uh, have really you know, explicitly defrauded students. You have low income um folks with with uh, high levels of of debt but for the most part these are these are the most privileged members of our society or at least a privileged class in our society and this was brought home to me by the new york times news story when the word initially came down that biden was doing this and they featured this uh, young woman who apparently shrieked with joy in her dorm room when she heard that that biden was doing this and she is the daughter of Mexican immigrants. She went to community college for the first two years because that's all she could afford and then got into UCLA uh, for two years and had substantial level of debt. And I was reading this. I was like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe slightly, maybe I feel my heartstring just the slight being tugged the slightest 
And then, then at the end, it's and and she's currently pursuing a master's degree at the London School of Economics, right? And so she's going to be okay, right? Her her twenty, I think it was twenty five thousand dollars in debt. She's going to be able to pay that. And you know, there are countless millions uh, children of immigrants who haven't gone to co- aren't going to college, let alone to the London School of Economics. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the reason you go to college is so that you're more employable and so that you can get a higher paying job. Um, I think the the White House has pretty much admitted that this is basically going to help out the top 5% of earners. So, and and meanwhile, it's going to cost the taxpayer and many of many taxpayers did not go to college or if they did, then they uh, took the cost of it into account in making their decisions and made huge sacrifices in many cases. Um, it's going to cost them about you know $2,000 a year. So this is um, unfair just uh, as a starting point. I'd also say just to develop the point that Michael said, uh, it is true that many European welfare states sort of give out uh, higher education for free or not free, taxpayer funded um, for everyone. In fact, I'm I'm sitting here feeling a bit guilty because I did my undergraduate degree in Scotland and, and so it was uh, on the state. But I did notice a big difference in, in my undergraduate degree in Scotland and my graduate degree in uh, NYU, seeing how universities spent their money. And I think if you have a budget because you have this limited amount of money and you're not going to be able to charge uh, people huge amounts of money, then you're much more conscious about the kind of decisions that you make. And I think it just the, the thought that these greedy universities who frankly don't really have any incentive to care about whether or not you're employable at the end of it. I mean, if you want to give them $70,000 to study gender theory and you can't get a job uh, anywhere other than as a waitress afterwards, it doesn't really affect them at all. Um, so it does, it encourages this irresponsible uh, behavior. And it's just the greedy universities are, are the main beneficiaries here, followed by people who, to your point, would have been absolutely fine without it. And meanwhile, it's going to worsen inflation, which already hits people uh, with lesser means worse. And it's uh, and it's going to be unfair to the people who don't have any interest in going to college and or who have already spent off, uh, have already paid off their, their loans. So Charlie, there. There are a couple of arguments that have been advanced for this the last 24 hours or so. One is, no, actually, th- this is not for people who are better off. It's overwhelmingly going to go to pe- uh, middle-income uh, people. I haven't seen um, a specific pushback against that, but I imagine part of the pushback against it is, yeah, if you're a 25-year-old uh, you know, who just graduated college, you might be making you know, $45,000, but you're not going to be making that you know, 10 years from now one and also the administration has compared this to the PPP loans during the pandemic uh, grants and says well look all, all, everyone was in favor of that why aren't you in favor of this why why are you you know Republicans who voted for that how possibly can be complaining about this well I'll, I'll preface what I'm about to say by noting that I largely stop at the gate on this in that I don't believe, and I don't think anyone has any obligation to believe any of the arguments that are advanced. I mean, we mentioned the legal question earlier. We can analyze that OLC memo if we want to, but to do so and to treat it as if it's a real legal argument is to indulge a false premise. It's not. It's a joke. It's an insult. It's a slap in the face. The same is true with the substantive case that has been made for this. The case for this is that some people in this country should be given up to $20,000. That's it. There's nothing else there. But if you want me to run through the arguments they are presenting in bad faith, fine. The (laughs) idea that the the people who are benefiting uh, should be evaluated without counting the asset in question is absurd. If I own a house... You mean the degree? Right. If I own a house, and also I have a loan on it, and then someone says, what is Charles Cook's net worth? You don't just look at my income. You look at the value of the house. How much could I sell it for? 
But for some reason, we look at people who have been to Yale for four years, and we don't count the value of the asset that they purchased with their loan. And so you see news stories saying, but he only makes $72,000 a year at the moment. Well, okay, <laughs> let's count the asset and let's count the future earning potential. Let's determine whether or not his life was improved by the money he borrowed, he took out, and he spent. If it wasn't, then we have a big problem. Then we have a consumer product that is fraudulent at root. If it was, then it's absurd to ask everyone else to subsidize him, to ask plumbers and electricians and waitresses, even if the degree in question is useful, especially if the degree in question is useful. I understand the desire to point out the folly of basket weaving or theater if it's not going to provide a return on investment. But the case is actually even weaker when the person in question is a lawyer or doctor. In terms of PPP, this is a disgusting conflation. And one doesn't have to have been entirely comfortable with PPP to acknowledge that. The PPP program, and this was written into the law by Congress under the established constitutional order, was akin in its intention to, say, the takings clause within the Fifth Amendment. That was understood from the start. This was not a freestanding handout. The idea, like it or not, support it or not, was that governments had prevented people from running their businesses, that this was an imposition, that the potential economic consequences of this were extraordinary, and that the government, therefore, Re uh, recompense, would compensate the people to whom this had been done by giving them money and leaving it in their hands if they used it to keep those businesses running. That money did not go into the hands of the business owners. If it did, they had to pay it back. That money went to the workers and for debt service and for healthcare costs and so on. It was also available to everyone. There was no arbitrary class or social or educational distinction. It was clear up front. As has been the deal with student loans. With student loans, the benefits accrue to the borrower, not their employees. And they knew right from the beginning that they had to pay them back. But this idea that those two things are equivalent, and again, one doesn't have to favor PPP to acknowledge this, is a cynical lie. To use the White House Twitter account to shame the people who worked with the government, took the loans, and used them to keep their businesses afloat when those businesses had been forcibly shut down, to the benefit of their employees, uh, is one of the most grotesque things I've ever seen. I, I don't think it will work. But again, I will reiterate, we can talk about this, and I'm happy to, but there is no case here. There is no legal case, and everybody knows that. And there is no case for doing this beyond people who the Democrats now consider to be their base, people they need to show up in November, people who are close to the president, people who are close to our elite institutions, people uh, who are close to the universities themselves, have decided that they don't think it is fair to be asked to pay to experience and benefit from a product that they desperately want. And they have abused their position in our culture at great economic and social and constitutional cost to push the President of the United States to steal between half a trillion and a trillion dollars of money that was not appropriated by Congress and hand it out to them. And the consequences for this politically and otherwise should be profound. So MBD, what is your view on how we fix the underlying problem of the cost of 
of college, which is obviously a driver of the student loan thing and how we structure student loans and and um, subsidize student loans. Obviously, is is uh, uh, driving the the tuition in turn. Warren Cass, our friend and sometimes ideological adversary, had a very interesting piece up at Politico a day or two ago, grappling with with this issue. And one, he says, you know, we just shouldn't sacralize student debt and consider it, you know, inherently more virtuous or, or better than other debt. You know, <laughs> Biden easily could have just, why didn't he forgive credit card debt or auto loan debt? Why is it student debt? And unless you're particularly invested in this this one class of people. And two, he suggests, you know, uh, curtailing these these student loan program programs and you know doing grants that are kind of tied to the the median cost of uh, an education at public universities in a given state, something to create an incentive for some downward pressure on the price here rather than constantly driving it up with uh, subsidies that are ultimately captured, as Maddie was pointing out, by the universities themselves. No, I think, I actually thought Oren's piece was brilliant and right, and it's a more moderate version of what I'm in the mood pr to propose, which is more along the lines of Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. Um, <laughs> You know, we should just like we should, you know, just chase out the professors and take the property uh, and redisperse it to politically more valuable uh, allies. I mean, that's that's what they've done. I mean, that is what it, that we have to realize that this is the uh, the hammerlock that progressives have now across academia is partly a creation of uh, federal funding this way, right? And um, uh, and and manipulation of the admissions department, right? Once progressives took over the admissions departments and booted out the old blue bloods, uh, now they are, are doing the same kinds of discrimination to maintain their hegemony in these institutions. Uh, I think... I think yeah, treating student debt as normal debt is the the first stop, but it also requires. Um, it, it's not the policy change will be very important, but there's a kind of cultural aspect to it where uh, we've had in both parties this idea that education is the primary path mm -hmm. toward upward mobility in this country. And so that's why even student debt relief isn't as unpopular nationwide as it is on this podcast. Um, and why people are hesitant to go after uh, programs like Pell Grants, which ultimately are, you know, as Maddie said, just the benefits are really captured by the colleges, not by the students. Um, so th that's a huge myth and maybe it's going to come under economic pressure because in fact, the gains to, uh, tradesmen are, are, are set to outstrip the gains to your average, uh, Excel spreadsheet jockey in the next couple of, uh, decades. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see Maddie, the, the, um, you know, all things being equal, uh, a college degree is quite valuable and will increase your earnings um, over over the, your lifetime. But all th things aren't necessarily equal. Depends a lot on what major you get. You get a lot of college graduates who end up in jobs that would did not require a four-year degree. You get a lot of people who were convinced that this was really the, the only uh, viable path to be a productive American. So end up taking on and not finishing um, a, a degree. And it's just this this credentialism is just so deeply ingrained in our uh, our culture, you know, that you're, you're somehow you studied a, a Elizabethan literature um, at, at a liberal arts college and you're a barista at Starbucks and you're more valuable than than a plumber, you know, who's, right. who's uh, working his, you know, what off every single day and is engaged in a job that is intellectually taxing, like in a different way than reading a Shakespeare sonnet, but that requires a lot of thought and, and problem solving. Yeah. I mean, it's whether or not you should go to college depends on what your talents and strengths and interests are. It's a basic point, but one that's often forgotten. People just assume it's this cultural rite of passage that 
you have to do and uh, there's lots of pressure on on people to go to college and you're considered um lesser if if you don't go and that that shouldn't be the case it, it should be a specific academic vocation for people going into jobs that require that type of skill and that type of education it's not just about skills of course it's um it's also about uh being able to think critically and and contribute to uh the developing thought of the nation so that's a that's a big problem the, the other thing about it as well is that it causes a sort of credential inflation when everybody goes i mean it used to be that you just went to college and you got your bachelor's degree and and then you got a job but now people feel the need to get masters degrees to be able to uh, stand out from the fact that everybody's got a bachelor's degree now and um, it's it's kind of ridiculous like you shouldn't need a master's degree for a lot and you don't need a master's degree for a lot of the the jobs being offered one thing i appreciate about national review is it doesn't it's not even particularly interested if um let alone where you you went to college um but to to the point about how to to fix the problem i i think uh, it really does require addressing the financial incentives for colleges and i think josh holly introduced legislation in 2019 that would require colleges to be half of the loans um for borrowers who default uh, i think mm-hmm. Somebody else has suggested, you know, requiring schools to take a, an equity stake of, of 10 to 20 percent in student loans. I think putting them in a position where they're mm-hmm. liable for some of this waste is is smart. Um, and beyond that, I think, as Michael says, it's a, it's a cultural change. Uh, we need to be able to uh, provide other alternatives for college for, for people for whom it's, it's not a smart decision. Well, and by the way, one of the things that's really distressing is that the way student debt is privileged in the law has encouraged not just the development of these predatory online universities or the expansion in traditional colleges of a more predatory night school version of themselves. You'll see this a lot like, you know, Fordham University, which is like a respectable B tier Catholic university have like a very predatory night program that like, takes blue collar workers, uh, get loads them with debt to finance the school. And then, you know, they never graduate or they graduate and go right back to their, the same job they had the whole time. But it also has encouraged colleges to expand into fields that never were done at an academic level, like turf management or, uh, a new one is like Homeland Security Management is like a major at, at schools. Like you're going to study Homeland Security Management and then get a job with the FBI uh, at, at the end or somewhere in DHS. Um, the, this is a ridiculous, um, like these are obvious signs of uh, a kind of creeping Sovietization of American education uh and uh, how irrational it's become and and we need real reform of higher ed funding and and this was just the worst possible step you could have taken all right mbd point points to you for the last five minutes references both to the dissolution of the monasteries under henry the eighth and the soviet union with that let's go to charlie with the double barreled exit question charlie the Biden student loan forgiveness will eventually be struck down by the courts, yes or no? And it makes you more pessimistic, more optimistic, or the same in your view of the prospects, long-term prospects of the American Republic. If the question is ever put before a court, it will be struck down so hard the Biden administration won't know what has happened. The question, as everyone has noted, is whether or not the plaintiffs can get past the standing requirement. I have no expertise in this area, uh, so I don't know. But if it reaches the court, the laughable legal argument will be exposed as such. In relation to the second question, it makes me extremely pessimistic for the American Republic, because if this stands, we don't have one. MBD. 
Um, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm about the same on the American Republic, uh, because I generally, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I'm not the same as Charlie, oh, the same, about, not the same about, as Charlie, the same as you same, were, same as always, uh, yeah. on the American Republic, <laughs> but, but I am, uh, I have to say, I think these are the death throes of this system. Um, which system the having a the, Congress or the, the college, no, 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 the the educational system. Uh, I think there's been so much, uh, healthy development at the private and homeschooling um, level, especially in the past five years. Uh, and I, I think that that is going, that energy is not going to stop at renovating primary and secondary school education in the United States. I think it's going to continue uh, to put healthy pressure on colleges who are also going to face, you know, cataclysmic problems of, of um, you know, declining population of young people in the United States. Uh, there are fewer students to enroll. Um, so this this era of expansion is sure to end on some level, um, unless you just go completely into enrolling foreign students. But again, I don't think you can make the education more worthless uh, and and get a good result from it. So, And the, the fortunes of the colleges will undoubtedly diminish when we start the drone, drone strikes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so MBD, so you're, you're the same in your view of the American prospects of the American Republic. And will this be struck down in the courts? I just don't know who has, it, the question is who has the standing to sue. So I have no, I have no idea. It's like a, an NA answer for me. Maddie Kearns, we have some evasion on the will be struck down <laughs> question and a couple different answers on the American Republic. Sure. So I'll just uh, I'll just assume that somebody somewhere has the standing and it does get to the Supreme Court. Um, and I think in that case, uh, it would be effectively dead on arrival, given the Supreme Court's decision um, related to the EPA back in June, which made clear that you can't take major action without congressional authorization. And the Republic, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll leave the, the despair to Charlie. So, <laughs> so it sounds plausible when he talks about it. So I, I guess that's that's the end. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> so I'm with you. I, I'm kind of an optimistic, uh, optimist on the legal question. I think someone somewhere will get standing and it, th this thing will go down hard. You know, the court has said, and uh, I think Scalia wrote it as he did so many other memorable lines, that Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes. And, and this, the theory here is the HEROES Act was like this massive, aggressive bull elephant that was just bludgeoned and uh, squeezed, you know, screaming the whole way into the tiniest of holes. And no one noticed, no one noticed, not even the people who drafted it. And that's not not going to stand. I'm the same same on the American Republic. Uh, there, there's a I have a, a, a already a healthy dollop of, of pessimism in the, in there. So I, I don't think this uh, this changes the trajectory, unfortunately. But it is a a, a, a highly uh, worrying development. So with that, let's go to Charlie for an upbeat, very cheerful read from our friends Express VPN. Absolutely. I love ExpressVPN. I use ExpressVPN. And in the year 2022, it is shocking to me that everyone isn't using ExpressVPN. You should install it on your devices immediately and particularly on your kids' devices. If your kids have devices, you wouldn't let them walk home from school without telling them not to talk to strangers. You wouldn't tell them not to get uh, into windowless vans, right? So why would you let them go online without using ExpressVPN? Now, you're probably thinking, what does ExpressVPN do? Why does every family need a VPN? Why do my kids' devices need ExpressVPN? Well, it's because every device, phones, computers, tablets, whatever, as long as it's connected to the internet, will have a unique IP address, which is like an internet phone number. And it can reveal some personal information about you like where you live. And also, if you know what the IP address is and you can tag other information with it, then you can see what people are doing. 
And it's actually not that difficult for a stranger online to find your IP address. If you've ever clicked on a sketchy link or if you've opened an email with a bugged image, your IP address has almost certainly been exposed. And because you can link IP addresses to physical location, who knows what kind of creeps could physically track your kids down using their IP addresses? Well, the good news is you don't have to expose your IP address. At least you don't have to expose it to anyone except ExpressVPN, which will delete it immediately. ExpressVPN is an app that hides your real IP address, and it replaces it with a dummy one. Uh, which is randomized each time. And that dummy one will keep you safe and private. And it's extremely easy to use. All you need to do is download the ExpressVPN app onto your phone or your computer or your tablet. And then you just tap one button to turn it on and you're protected. Even my four-year-old could figure this out. Uh, And the coolest part is you can choose what country you want your IP address to look like it's coming from, which is useful, not just because if you choose a local data center, you'll get the best speeds, less latency, and so on, but also because some services, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, sports websites, give you different shows and information data depending on what country you're in. So you can pretend using ExpressVPN that you're in England or France or Australia, uh, or California, or what you will. Uh, I uh, I love this product. I use it myself because I can just switch country and get hundreds of extra shows for free. I can watch uh, sports highlights, especially soccer, that I wouldn't be able to uh, without it. Um, and Premier League, not great for me at the moment as a Manchester United fan, but I'm hoping it's going to get better. And anyway, it's not ExpressVPN's fault. So if you want to secure your family's online activity too and unlock tons of new shows, you can do so by visiting expressvpn.com slash editors. And if you use that link, you get three months extra free. That's express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash editors to learn more. Excellent. Thank you, Charlie. So, Maddie, sticking with the loan forgiveness here, we're going to hit the politics and then widen the aperture and, and talk about... Uh, the general political environment a little bit too, but clearly this is a political calculation on the part of the White House. They need to gin up turnout. There are signs that Democratic turnout is already uh, taking an uptick in, in a way that might meaningfully affect the midterm elections. And this is a play to get young voters, you know, that that young woman I, I mentioned earlier, if, if she weren't in London, uh, you know, m- maybe she'd, she'd be here here voting. But she, this is like the biggest thing that's happened to her, right? There's a the biggest thing government ever has done for her. And you would assume she'd be highly motivated to get out to vote. And she's going to vote for the Democrats. And the, the calculation is, well, there there is this kind of generalized discontent from this policy and all the people who aren't getting the benefit, but they're not being directly harmed. So net net, it's going to be an upside for the Democrats. Yeah. So I think this is just yet another example of Biden putting short term interests and the interests of radicals uh, ahead of long term uh, interests. Um, I mean, obviously progressives within the party have been demoralized, having, Joe Manchin sort of strangle all their dreams. And this is kind of him, Biden, throwing throwing them a, bo- a bone, essentially. But I just don't I just don't see the uh I don't see the the long-term uh, effects of it playing out in his favor. Um I mean it is divisive among Democrats. Um you wouldn't get that impression the way it's being covered necessarily, but you had Tim Ryan of Ohio, um who you know was saying he's he's really running um, as a working class uh, candidate, voice of the working class candidate, and he's said this is basically a gift to the privileged at the expense of, of the underprivileged, um, and he's he's right on that, and time will will show that to be the case, and so I think it's actually probably helpful to Republicans to be able to point to yet another. Um, instance of of something Biden did, which worsened inflation and left uh, hardworking. Um, Americans uh, working and in, in, in lower middle class Americans worse off. So MBD, you have been sounding the alarm for a while now. You know, in- inflation might um, 
uh, alleviate a, a, a little bit. The economy might look a little better. You take the edge off the economic discontent and oh. things begin to get look, look better for the Democrats and peers that might be happening. We had this New York special election where the Republican was um, competitive, wasn't wasn't a, a Trump district, but the kind of district that in a massive wave you'd expect uh, or a substantial wave you'd expect uh, Republicans to pick up. And the, the um, Democrat won there. And just in very special elections and other indicators, Democratic turnout is up. And obviously, part of this is the Dobbs ruling. Most of us, uh, at least I'll speak for myself, were dismissive about kind of the long term effect that Dobbs would have. You know, we thought, at least I thought, you know, first couple of weeks, huge deal, and then it would dissipate over time. Maybe that's still happening. And you know we're in the medium term here rather than the long term, but it's still it's it's still having an uh, effect that is helping Democrats. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I mean what I've heard from friends who are kind of in the politics game is that at least during this summer, uh, the the offals are the people that are most politically engaged, the affluent white liberal uh, women, <laughs> affluent women. Uh, who are liberal and white uh, are answering the polls in, in uh, numbers that are kind of unbelievable and that the pollsters have to work around. Yeah. Um, I think we've been talking to the same political consultant. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Hi, Luke. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I, I've heard that. Um, and I feel like I've, I see evidence of that too across like my social media feeds where, uh, you know, across Instagram, I see a lot of engaged content from uh, liberal white women uh, where I don't see it from elsewhere. And I just do think the other thing I get, like bit of information I get and have been watching steadily is these emails from our friend David Bonson showing all of the signs of inflation ending and, uh, you know, core commodities starting to come down in price, even if they're still elevated. And with gas prices coming down, um, I think you're just, uh, you're no longer in this mode where Americans are looking at this like, uh, I can't get orders in mm -hmm. from on basic products. You yeah, know, on the uh, um, on on the gas prices, it's still high. You know where, where I am. Still high. Like, it's three eighty nine, but it's not five dollars. So, there's, so there's, my little uh, my little metric here is is um, so, several weeks ago it was five dollars. I'd, I'd be filling up the 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 tank, and and all of a sudden the window would go down. And my wife says, "Stop! Don't don't put any more in. <laughs> It'll be okay for now." And at three eighty nine, she's not doing that anymore. Right, and uh, I mean, for me, it was like as it was as it looked like it was going to go up to six. Like suddenly, I I was like my hair was on fire. Like looking at. The prices, like, oh my gosh, where is this actually going to end? But if, when prices come down a bit, it doesn't feel out of control anymore, even if it's still elevated. It doesn't feel like the the country is unraveling in mm -hmm. the same way it feels like when you're totally uncertain uh, that prices will ever come down. And yeah, now orders are coming in, coming in. Like, if you need a refrigerator, like the delays are more manageable than they were even a few months ago. So it still feels like you're living in America again. And I think that's the difference between the 30s and the 40s for Joe Biden's approval rating. Mm -hmm. like I, I think just that factor alone. And if inflation comes down and you have really low unemployment and you've passed a bunch of goodies for your um, main constituencies like uh, affluence, college students, and uh, you know prescription drug pricing, environmental groups. Um, I don't know. That's not the worst. That is not the worst story to tell. It's certainly not an FDR-like transformation of the federal government's relationship with the people. But it is. It's not the worst record to run on for a Democrat. So, Charlie, we were talking about this uh, before the we started recording. We'll go into it again here. Let's look at the think about the Senate map. And it, it does seem, you know, Michael alluded to the difference between 30s and 40s for for Biden. He still is in the 30s, you know, in, in a lot of polls. We might he might pop up into the 
pop ups the wrong word, but he, he might inch up into the, the, the forties, but the, it, it does seem at least now at the moment that Democrats have, and, and, and this, you know, is an extraordinary thing have, have achieved some sort of separation, um, between th- them and the, their, their president. And Matt Continetti has a, a good column at the Free Beacon today. We'll, we'll run it uh, tomorrow on NRO, just pointing this out. You know, you, you have kind of soft disapproval for, for Biden, you know, people who disapprove of him, um, not strongly, what I don't know, it was 16 or 20 percent. And a lot of those people are not, um, voting against, you know, are supporting other, other Democrats who are on the, the ballot this year. But you look at the Senate map, Pennsylvania is, is obviously no pun intended, a, a keystone to the uh, Senate con, uh, control. And you have Oz, who's been trailing badly there in some recent polls is, is looking better, you know, uh, up in single digits. And Fetterman, there was a, uh, a town hall he had or a rally where he was um, speaking, you know, in front of a, a group th- this week, and it was painful. It, it was, you know, he suffered a stroke, and I do, did not mean to mock him in any way. I wish him all the best, a, a swift recovery. It's a terrible thing to have been on the cusp of achieving what must have been, you know, a, a lifelong um, political aim and, and suffer a stroke right before winning the primary. But he he could um, he had real trouble speaking, and it, it's hard as senator. That's about two thirds of your job is is talking to people and and giving speeches. And I'm not sure that this has fully been absorbed by Pennsylvania voters yet. And you don't want if you're Oz, you don't want to run ads about it, right? I mean, that would be extremely in poor taste. I think there's been a would sympathy it? effect uh, for like it would. Uh, I think if you tease for- him about it, it might be in poor taste. I don't think there's anything wrong whatsoever with pointing out that Fetterman seems at the moment unable to do the job he's applied for. Yeah, I think if you ran an ad on that, I think there'd be a, a backlash. I think it's the kind of thing Perhaps. you need people to, to notice uh, on their own, and they will. So anyway, th- this just goes to... If if um, Republicans hold that seat, I think they're you know in pretty good shape uh, for for taking the Senate. Even if they lose it, um, you still have Ron John in Wisconsin, who you need to hold on. Uh, he hasn't been looking great, but the history there is he's not looked great in the past and uh, uh, turned out just fine. And then you you need to win um, two out of three. Assuming you lose Pennsylvania, of Arizona, Georgia. And Nevada, and I think we're in agreement on this. I, I we both assume, even though he's not a good candidate, that Herschel Walker will pull out Georgia, and then N- Nevada should be a pretty good um, state. You know, Adam Laxalt, a, uh, a serious candidate. He has some stop the steal baggage that they're going to make a lot of use of, but it wouldn't be shocking at all, uh, at all, if he won in Nevada. So. I, I'm still fairly bullish, you know, with some asterisks and caveats about Republicans taking the Senate. I am a little bit all at sea on this, in that I think Republicans are going to win the House. Yeah. When we ran through off air which races I think Republicans are going to win and lose in the Senate, I did come out with the Republicans having a a slim majority. But I do think that the Republican Party has a problem going into November. Two problems, actually. The first problem is that as it did in 2010, and to a lesser extent 2012, but not in 2014 so much, the Republican Party has chosen poor candidates and is going to fritter away a number of winnable races. In 2010, the obvious examples were Nevada. Harry Reid would have lost to anyone who wasn't Sharon Angle and Delaware. This time around, we're looking at Pennsylvania, probably New Hampshire, uh, and this will matter. The second problem the Republican Party has is that the Republican Party doesn't have an agenda. What's it running for? It's running against the status quo. It's running against the economy. It's running against Joe Biden. And that works. That works for Republicans and it works for Democrats. There's a natural pendulum in politics and there's a tendency to blame 
the incumbent president, especially government more broadly, for whatever latent issues are in the economy. A lot of that with Biden is fair. A lot of what he's done has caused a backlash or made people's lives work, but a, a, a lot of it is not fair. And if inflation does keep coming down, if gas prices do keep coming down, and if they're not offset by the harms caused by the remedy, higher interest rates and perhaps a recession, then the advantages that the Republicans had, because they weren't engendered by the Republicans, but were engendered either by the Democrats' behavior or by bad luck, bad timing, will disappear. And when you run an election campaign based on nothing with a whole bunch of bad or mediocre candidates, you tend to pay the price. Uh, and when we add in some unknowns, and I think they are still unknowns, the consequences of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, for example, I feel somewhat unsure about what's going to happen in November, with one notable exception, and that is that the Republican Party in Florida, I think, is going to run the table. That's what's, and that's think, what's important, right, Charlie? Well, it, it's it's not the only thing that's important, and as we've just seen, you have to have the right people at all levels of government, but uh, I, I'm confident enough living here to make that prediction that the Republicans are going to win the Senate seat. Marco Rubio will win that, that the Republicans are going to win the governor's mansion again. Ron DeSantis will win that. And I would not be surprised uh, if every single statewide office went Republican and the Republicans had a super majority for the first time in a while in the Senate. So, MBD, exit question to you. How do you characterize the November election at the moment? There is still a Republican tidal wave in the offing. There's a five foot wave surf up dude in the offing. There is a small wave lapping pleasantly against the shore. Or Republicans are dead in the water, just like the ship in the rhyme of the ancient mariner when, uh, everyone, when, the, when the wind leaves, leaves them and everyone <laughs> begins to die of thirst. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to pick the last one based on how literary it was, but uh, I, I think it's a small, I think it's a small wave. I think, um, I think Biden is still an overall drag. Because of his ill health, I think uh, there's still a lot of people who want to punish Democrats for um, COVID stuff, schools, uh, radicalism, and the like. But there's also, you know, Democratic candidates are trying to moderate on some of these issues ahead of the ahead of the game, and some of the potential squad members lost their primaries, so it's not as quite as radical a Democratic Party you're running against uh, in many cases. So, yeah, a, a moderate wave lapping on the shore. Andy Kearns? Uh, I agree with Michael, but you, you said lapping pleasantly on the shore. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, I was listening. <laughs> okay. I think there's a small wave coming. And I think that the results that we saw in new york while instructive may tell us more about the climate in places such as new york than about the country at large in much the same way as florida wasn't especially instructive about the country at large in 2018 if you remember that night the results came in very fast in florida because you know we actually know how to count ballots and People said, ah, well, I'm not seeing any signs yet of the wave we all thought was coming. But by the next morning, it was clear that the Democrats had done very well. And um, uh, I think that may end up being the case with some of the tea leaves we're now reading from early returns. So uh, I'm going to say s somewhere between that very small, pleasant wave and a, a five footer. Um, so with that, here is a very special message from our friends at the American Federation for Children. Hey, everybody. This is Corey DeAngelis from the American Federation for Children. It is about time we fund students, not systems. 
After all, education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting a particular institution. The good news is that the wind is at our backs. We're winning on the front of education freedom, and we're going to free every single family from the clutches of the teachers' unions once and for all. But we need your help in this fight, and you could do so at edfreedom.com. That's edfreedom.com. Thank you guys so much. This is Corey DeAngelis from the American Federation for Children. So, MBD, big news in the public health front. Anthony Fauci has announced that he's hanging up the, the lab coat and the mask. He is uh, doing a media tour, of course. What else would he do? Patting himself on the back, of course. He noted a lot of people are going to medical school now, not because of him per se, but just of the symbol that he is of uh, science and the virtues of science. I'm going to ask you what you think of this and then duck under my desk. Uh, listen, there is not a uh, river wide enough for this elf to be tossed <laughs> over. I mean, uh, listen, uh, Anthony Fauci, <laughs> uh, Anthony Fauci has hurt public health in such a dramatic way over the course of this pandemic um, by being so baldly political. Um, he, he had a chance to be apolitical, but he's the one who chose to criticize red state governors like Kemp and DeSantis, uh, criticize red state cultural things like college football games happening in the uh, autumn of 2021, when he had said nothing about giant outdoor protests for George Floyd um, in the summer before. Uh, he, like, we have the documentation. He knew masks were not basically useless. And he betrayed that belief later when he defended the use of masks, saying that they were a symbol of the kind of thing he wanted people to do. Uh, um, you know, the United States was uniquely uh, a bad place to be a child during the COVID-19 pandemic, during, uh, in the, a uniquely bad place in the world to be a child. Uh, your school was much more likely to be closed down or for longer or to have more restrictive rules in place once it was open. Uh, and that's because of health officials like Fauci, who advised keeping schools closed throughout the entirety of 2020, uh, whatever they say now, I mean, he's gone in recent weeks and lied and said he never advocated. He always advocated for keeping schools open. Uh, which is not true. Uh, and, and finally, like, uh, you know, Deborah Burks said recently that they knew she knew that the vaccines wouldn't prevent transmission. And he knew, I assume Dr. Fauci knew, which means that his support for vaccine mandates, which led to the firing, unjust firing of so many people uh, before they were eventually abandoned or the, uh, either by individual companies or by the federal government, um, was bogus and just was needless extra suffering uh, in the name of, of science, but not actually according to the science we had. Yeah, one, one of the reasons Marjorie Taylor Greene was suspended from, from Twitter, and there might've been all, all sorts of other good reasons, but one reason was that she said people still got the, the virus even if they're vaccinated. And she was yeah. suspended for that. Yeah, I, 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 and that's the thing is like, Dr. Fauci, more than any other single figure in American life has contributed to the sense among scores of millions of Americans that whatever the authorities are today calling a conspiracy theory will turn out to be true and the conventional wisdom six months, a year or two years from now. Uh, it's, it is deeply corrosive to public authority, deeply corrosive to our politics that this is the case. And he's the poster boy for it. And I, I, I cannot wait for Republicans to take back the house and put him on a hot seat and actually grill him. And, it, and they, they need to take a lesson from Rand Paul who managed to, to, tr to like stick to a more forensic case about what he said and what the science was 
uh, and nail him down on this because uh, if we have another crisis, we can't, I, I don't know what the country will be like at the end of it. Uh, another public health crisis. If um, leaders like F in the Fauci mold are at the top setting guidelines, um, <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to make it. Maddie. Yeah. I mean, look, I would not have wanted to have that job. It was, a notoriously difficult job. It, you know, there was so much uncertainty, especially early on. And so I basically separate Fauci's mistakes into two categories. One is the forgivable mistakes, or at least mistakes that lots of people made. And I think some of the decisions to close things down, including even schools, honestly, early on in the pandemic are, are sort of forgivable. But of course, as time went on, it became less and less excusable. But the more egregious things, as, as Michael's referenced, is the, the, the mendacity and I, I think the, the reluctance to take seriously the, the origin of, of the coronavirus and, and all the reasons the NIH had for, um, for being uncomfortable with that, I think, are, are inexcusable. And then, of course, there's just the, the arrogance of the guy. I mean, just the way he speaks, you know, referring to himself in, in the third person, saying he represents science, that he – it was just – really weird, um, really creepy. And uh, I, th I think that in, that in itself was enough to get people's backs up. And, and as, as Michael says, it's, it's understandably eroded uh, trust, which will have consequences more than people just being upset and angry. So I, I think Michael's right. I think th there needs to be ability for, for that. And so, yeah, he should be put in the hot seat. Yeah, just in this position, it just human nature being what it what it is, it really would have been hard to resist the the, the temptation to become a celebrity and let the whole thing get to your ego. And man, he did, man, he did. So Charlie, you know, hustle things along here a little bit because we need to get Sarah out of here uh, within ten minutes or so. Exit question to you, channeling MBD. Is now the only appropriate attitude to th things public health authorities tell us uh, is the only appropriate attitude radical doubt? Yes or no? Certainly skepticism. I don't think they have demonstrated that they deserve reflexive trust. And if they want reflexive trust, then they're going to have to reform. And reforming starts with acknowledging the mistakes that they made. But instead, Anthony Fauci is doing a media tour in which he talks about what he calls the Fauci effect and lauds himself for his perfect performance over the last two years. So yeah, I'd say skepticism. I don't know about radical doubt. So MBD, I'm going to skip you because I assume you are a radical doubt. Um, Maddie Kearns? Yeah, I'm going to say radical doubt. And to, to use my scientific uh, method of political data, I collected myself from a sample size of one uh, I was recently on a plane and the woman next to me who is a Democrat was uh, was telling me how how disappointed she is and how she, she can't trust Fauci and any NIH. So I think, yes, radical doubt. So I'm with Charlie. I'm not, uh, maybe I'm too credulous. I'm not all the way in the radical doubt camp, but I am in the, the skepticism camp. With that, let me do a real quick plug for NR Plus, just to emphasize this is a really important way to support our valuable journalism. If you appreciate what we do, if you find it uh, highly informative and entertaining and all the rest of it, please, please, please consider paying for it. It's really important to us. Uh, donations are important too. If you want to, if you want to do that or have done that, we really appreciate it. But in terms of our business model going forward, just we need people to uh, sign up to uh, to read our our excellent content that unfortunately we can't produce for free. Everyone loves what they do here, but uh, uh, life being what it is, we do have to pay people salaries and people need salaries to actually pay their bills. And if we're going to make that work, we need you as a, a reader to do your part too. They're great uh, first time deals running at any given moment doesn't cost you an arm and the like. So please, please, please sign up if you haven't already for NR Plus and join tens of thousands of your fellow National Review readers. So let's hit a few other things before we go. Maddie, two words, wind chimes. Yeah. So as I as I just mentioned, I was uh, on a plane. I flew from um, 
New York to, to Scotland and I stopped off in Dublin and I was sat next to a very nice, kind lady. And whenever you're on a, a long flight and someone starts a conversation, you have that that feeling of, oh gosh, mm-hmm. are they are they going to expect <laughs> to talk mm-hmm. to me the whole, yeah. the whole way? But um, but actually she was delightful. And we we talked about a lot, a lot of different things. And um, I had quite a long layover for my next journey. And, and so uh, I walked her to her gate and she she pulled out of her, her bag a parting gift, uh, oh. which was some wind chimes made made in the USA. She was keen to emphasize that point, um, which I just thought was really, really sweet and lovely. Um, sweet. So, yeah, so I, I brought them home to my my parents and, and my mom was very taken with them. So we found a spot in the garden. Wow. Uh, for them so yes yeah, there you go exploring our faith in humanity that's, <laughs> that's awesome mbd you are doing some serious off-roading or maybe not off-roading but uh <laughs> some, some serious riding around on rented mopeds yeah so this is the thing when uh, my family goes down on vacation the boys rent uh a couple mopeds and we just take them around and uh they're like underpowered uh not the not the <laughs> This is like hardly Hell's Angels material here. It's actually quite a bit more modest than that. But um, just sneaking away after the kids have fallen asleep and driving up and down the barrier islands and these little sliver bridges between them in New Jersey uh, with the moon overhead and the the first chill of fall uh, hinting in the air late at night in August is awesome. And it's just, it's fun to go through these different towns all of these vacation towns have different rules so like ocean city is a dry town so it's notably notably quiet there at night uh compared to say atlantic city or or even ventnor uh but yeah hitting all the places on the monopoly board with a moped was my bit of fun over vacation awesome and charlie you've been taken with an old snl skit Featuring Chris Farley and Paul McCartney. The conceit is that Chris Farley is too nervous to interview Paul McCartney. So the whole uh, not quite realized interview uh, doesn't come off. And McCartney sits there most of the time twiddling his thumbs and tapping his foot. Uh, But what struck me about it, other than that Chris Farley's performance is so great, is that as a guest, McCartney's so good because the Beatles were pretty funny and they were in movies and they were used to uh, joking around with one another. And his comic timing is actually excellent. Often watching guests on SNL, you think, well, th- this is funny, but it's very obvious that they they don't fit in, that they do something else. But with McCartney, it wasn't. So this is going to provide some really important advice for married men out there. Probably you already know this, but but just just in case, listen up, listen up, guys. So if there's some ta- household task you really need to do, and your, your wife says that's all right, don't you don't need to do it right now. Just you should always be aware that's not a license forever, right? And, and it could and it, that license could be revoked at any time, especially during an unrelated argument that you make the mistake of winning. So you always got to be aware of that. Two, if you're going to do like a partial a partial task. You know, like if it's your job to clean up the kitchen and um, uh, you, you need to do like the most noticeable thing, whatever it is, if it, you're just going to do part of it. So like if a bowl of spaghetti fell off the kitchen table and, and um, it would take five minutes to clean that up and it's a, a huge, very picturesque mess, or there's like a, a pasta spot on the table that would take you 15 minutes, hypothetically, to, to get off. You got to do the bowl of spaghetti, e- even if it's less work. Um, you know, if you're going to pause and watch a Yankee game, hypothetically. So th- this came home to me that we got a delivery. My, my wife's very cost conscious appropriately. So apparently, you know, there's some savings involved if you get like 50, 40 pound, 40 pound bags of salt to put in your, uh, um, put in downstairs to soften your water as opposed to like 10. So these, these are in, in our, our garage and I know I got to get them down to the basement. She tells me a couple of, Oh, don't worry about it. No, don't worry about it now. But I know the clicks, the, the clock's ticking. And we had two stacks in different parts of the garage and I worked on one, one night and I got it down by about half, but a noticeable half. Like it, clearly progress had been made. And the other day I was like, I got a little time. I'm going to try to do this stack. Uh, some more. And then I realized like, you know, I take like four bags down. I realized it's not going to be noticeable. What It's going to take too much time to make this, get this stack down noticeably. So this, this labor is going to be wasted. What am I going to do? And I'm not too, too proud to confess. I moved that stack 
over to the other stack, <laughs> it seemed like the, the first stack was totally gone and I made serious <laughs> progress. So I hope Maddie, your future husband, is as good a husband and as shrewd and a good <laughs> husband as I am. I, I, I hope that blessing for you. Yeah, well, I make sure he listens to this advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I hope so, that Rich's wife doesn't listen to this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Relatives listening, please do not set me up. This time in the podcast for Editor Picks MBD. What's your pick? Uh, my pick is basically everything Charlie's written on the student loan stuff this week. Uh, but if I had to pick one, uh, Joe Biden illegally canceling, in quotes, student loans would be a middle finger to America. Um, just this is obviously uh hit charlie where it really hurts and he is hitting back three times as hard which is always fun to watch maddie kearns what's your pick uh well i'm going to embarrass us by by being uh keeping it within the group but i i actually picked um michael's the fauci effect i think that uh like charlie michael's a great polemicist and uh, when he's really annoyed about something he's very entertaining charlie cook well mine is our editorial on the student loan debacle. Biden's student debt decree wrong on every level. I was actually supposed to write this editorial, but uh, for reasons I won't go into it at too much length, um, I had no internet for about three days and no air conditioning either, and the power was in and out. And so I begged off. And I'm pleased that I did because this is a really brilliant editorial. It's much better than the one that I would have written. Uh, which savages every aspect of Biden's decision. So Charlie mentioned earlier that Republicans don't have agenda. Well, fortunately, we got a solution to that in the next print issue, which is devoted to what the Republican agenda should be. And you got to hope that as many Republican candidates and lawmakers as possible read this content. So that's it for us. You've been listening to a National Review podcast and a rebroadcast, retransmission, or account of this game without the express written permission of National Review Magazine is strictly prohibited. This podcast has been produced by the aforementioned incomparable Sarah Shitty, who makes it sound better than we deserve. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, MBD. Thanks to ExpressVPN and the American Federation for Children. And thanks especially to all of you for listening. We're the editors. We'll see you next time.